I am a sophomore English major, Spanish minor, and a member of the Ethel Waddell Gaffey Honors Program from Washington, DC. Also, I am the creator and host of the Fireside Spell Chat Zoom series, where members of the Spellman community have, over the course of this fall semester, been meeting to have open discussions about issues impacting our students due to this COVID-19 pandemic and the virtual learning experience that we are all having to engage in. It is truly my pleasure to welcome all of you to Courageous Conversations, Black in the C-Suite. The goal of Courageous Conversations is truly to inform and inspire because of the critical times that we are in right now, it is so important that Spelman be at the forefront in order to provide opportunities for connection, engagement, understanding, education, and most important of all, the empowerment of Black women. So we are thrilled to host this virtual conversation between the 10th president of Spelman College, Dr. Mary Schmidt Campbell and Ms. Shelley Archambault. Ms. Archambault, on behalf of the entire Spelman community and all of the Spelman students, I want to thank you for your gift of your book, Unapologetically Ambitious, Take Risks, Break Barriers, and Create Success on Your Own Terms. And I was reading and I was looking through some podcasts to get a sense of what I would be reading as I prepare to read your book. And I heard something that was so fascinating to me that I'm really, it really was just memorable. You spoke on creating a life plan, how you knew what you wanted to do, you figured out what had to be true in order for you to occupy that space. What was the path? What knowledge do you need? What skills do you need? And ultimately, how do you make that true for yourself? How do you make those ambitions and those dreams that you have come true? And you spoke about making choices every day, conscious choices in order to make what you wanted to happen come true. And even if it doesn't happen every time, you recognize that just that preparation that you're doing will prepare you for those opportunities that are going to happen that is meant for your life. And I just, that just stuck out to me. And I think that's so powerful of a message. And I'm so looking forward to getting that all throughout this book. And I'm, I just am so excited that the Spelman community will be able to experience that. As we complete the Spelman journey, I'm so positive that your book will be the blueprint that will guide our pathway toward fulfilling our divine destiny in our professional and personal lives. So I'm so appreciative of you for this gift. Now, everyone buckle up, get ready, and please join me in virtual applause to welcome two extraordinary women, Spelman College's president, Dr. Mary Schmidt Campbell and Ms. Shelley Archambault. Chandler, thank you so much for that very generous introduction. And thank you for your leadership with the Fireside Chats. I've had an opportunity to tune in to one, to one of them, and they are so helpful for everyone in the Spelman community. So thank you. Well, welcome everyone to our second conversation of Courageous Conversations, Black in the C-Suite. I'm going to begin by thanking UPS who's been the sponsor of these conversations and made it possible for us to send every single Spelman student um, one of Shelley Archambault's book. And to thank Shelley Archambault who made those books available to us. So thank you. We'll have everybody busy reading during the holiday break. So uh, the holidays are coming up. Our final exam period is over on Friday. So, How's everybody doing? Let me know in the chat how everybody is doing because we really enjoy having all of you here. I understand that there are close to 500 registrants. So we're delighted that all of you have decided to join us this afternoon. After I have my conversation with our guest, we're gonna open up the floor for Q and A. So please get your questions ready so you can become part of the conversation as well. This afternoon, I have the pleasure of having a conversation with Shelley Archambault, the former CEO of MetricStream. Reid Hoffman, the co-founder and former executive chairman of LinkedIn, described her as the woman who pulled off the most incredible Silicon Valley turnaround you've never heard of. In addition to being a su successful CEO, Ms. Archambault is also a successful corporate director. She currently sits on the boards of Nordstrom, Verizon, Roper Technologies, and Okta. She advises the Royal Bank of Canada, Capital Markets, and Forbes Ignite, as well as a number of growing startups. 
She is regularly named on who's who's list in technology and is the protagonist of a Harvard Business School case study, Becoming a CEO. Most recently, as Chandler informed us, she is the author of, and I love the whole title, Unapologetically Ambitious, Take Risks, Break Barriers, and Create Success on Your Own Terms. This book was written to inspire and provide the tools to enable women to fight the battles they will inevitably encounter, make the trade-offs they will inevitably have to make, and create the real life that they want for themselves and their families. In her spare time, she's a Forbes contributor, runs a gourmet dinner club, and writes a blog that provides career advice, insight, and other musings from her career. And we at Spelman are so delighted to welcome her because she is the mother of a Spelman alumna, Kathleen White, class of 2007, a co-founder of a not-for-profit, Can We Do It?, uh, a leader uh, following in her mother's footsteps. Welcome, Shelley. Well, thank you very much. It's wonderful to be here, Mary. Good to have you. Now, Shelley, when some, when, when very often when someone looks at the biography of someone like yourself who is so accomplished, and we see how you go from one position to an, uh, the next and ascend in the world, it looks like it's a straightforward trajectory, logical uh, uh, extension. But, but reading your book, you make it very clear that there are very real hurdles along the way. And I especially liked uh, how you describe some of the hurdles you encountered, some of the racial hurdles you encountered during your childhood. You grew up in Washington, D.C. and other, other places, but share with us some of the hurdles you encountered and some of the ways that you um, figured your way over or through those hurdles. Yes, well, thanks very much for, for asking, because you're right, honestly, my formative years as a child really shaped my overall outview, outview, outlook, if you will, as well as how I approached life. So I was born in DC, as you said, my family moved around quite a bit. My dad didn't have a college education. And so he was always going after the next opportunity that would help him support his family better. And I'm in Philadelphia and we're moving to California. Well, we moved to a suburb of California that was pretty far flung. And when we got there, I am literally first grade. And this is the 60s, which is kind of racially charged at the time. So mm -hmm. many people that were for civil rights, you had just as many that didn't want it. Um, and all of a sudden, I'm the only black kid in my class, not just the class, but in the grade. And not just the grade, but honestly, I think the school. That's oh. how homogeneous it was. And I had to walk to school every day along a, couple, a busy street called Balboa Boulevard. And people would yell horrible things at me. I mean, I'm six, seven years old, and these are adults. I mean, we're not talking about teenagers because it's during the school, right? It's just amazing. You know, kids would do bad things to me at school, and I got beat up by boys I knew. I mean, it was just, it was not a good experience. But my mother, you know, whenever I came home and you complain, something happened, right? It's not fair. Somebody did something to you or something that you should have gotten, you didn't get, whatever it might be. You come home and as a kid, you said, mom, it's not fair, right? It's not fair. Well, instead of taking me and just giving me a hug and saying, oh, it's okay, kind of thing, better, you know, better luck next time, she would just look at me and say, you're right. Life's not fair. What? Life's not fair? <laughs> I mean, as a kid, it's like, come on, it's supposed to be fair. Um, so that was just drilled into my head. Life is not fair. So what are you going to do about it? Right? In terms of, so don't expect it. And therefore, make your plans without it. It's like, okay. And then the other message that I got um, was, you can't control what people say to you. Mm. And you certainly can't control what people do to you. But you can control how you respond. So don't let them win. Don't, they win if they control your emotions, if they control how you feel about yourself, right? That's when they win. So don't let them win. You can't control what they do or say, but you can certainly control how you respond. So don't let them win. Well, that combination really set the stage for me 
to become just very intentional. I knew that I wasn't going to get what I wanted if I just did what everybody else did. The odds were absolutely not in my favor. So therefore, I was just very intentional about, all right, what do I want? How can I improve my odds to get it? And then focus and go get it. And literally, that's what I've done my entire life against professional objectives as well as personal objectives. Speaking of being very intentional and very focused, and speaking of your parents, I got the biggest kick uh, out of reading about your mother uh, in your book and the extent to which she was the person who gave you one of the early lessons in being intentional and deliberate. And what was that? Tell yeah. us that story. Yes. Okay. So you have to understand in my family, money was always very tight. My father got paid twice a month. And when dad got paid, everybody got an envelope. All of us, we got our allowance and dad got his allowance. So mom got the money and then we all got our envelopes. And then that was it until payday. Now mom had what was left, which frankly wasn't a lot because there were times that literally she would come back and borrow money. When I say borrow money, I mean like $10, you know, $8, whatever it is. She borrow money from us to stand her through payday. I mean, so that's how tight money was. She made all of our clothes because it was a whole lot cheaper to make clothes than to buy them. And she gave us an allowance and the allowance was 200 bucks. Well, you can't buy many clothes for $200, but you can buy a lot of fabrics. So you ended up with clothes. She made all dinners. We didn't go out to eat. I mean, restaurant. Oh my God. We didn't, you know, all those things we didn't have. So mom worked really, really hard. Well, fast forward. All right. Two things. I'm gonna tell you two stories if you don't mind, Mary. One is I'm now a teenager. I'm probably you know, 15, 16, I'm doing the dishes and mom had made dessert. She made a homemade dessert. We had homemade dessert every night and mm. I'm cooking up a pie plate and I'm looking at this pie plate and I'm thinking about how hard my mother works. She's the last one to bed, the first one up in the morning, right? I'd never even saw her sleep. And at dinner time, she cut the pie and everybody grabbed, you know, there's four kids, two parents, everybody grabs the pie and mom gets the smallest piece because she didn't grab, right? She just took what was left. And I'm like, you know what? I'm not doing that. Mm -hmm. and I walked out there and I said, mom, I've decided I am not having children. <laughs> she was like, what? I said, I'm not having kids. I mean, you do all this work, you never sleep. And then you make the dessert and you get the smallest piece of pie. I'm like, I, I'm not doing all this for the smallest piece of pie. And what mom said to me, which absolutely shaped my overall outlook, she said, Shelly, I don't care about that pie. If I cared about the pie, I wouldn't have the smallest piece. She goes, the key is to focus on what you care about mm -hmm. and make that happen and give up the rest because you can't have everything all at the same time. So pick what you want and then go after it. So, okay, well, fast forward. Mom comes home and tells us she bought a horse. <laughs> what? 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 We, we can afford a horse? I mean... Homemade clothes, don't go out to eat. The temperature in the house never went above 68 degrees in the wintertime. I mean, we can afford a, ho a horse. Well, that was the whole point. A horse was important to her. And all this dollar she'd been saving, squirreling away, right? All this stuff we did over the years. And mom bought herself a horse. So it just, you know, told us, figure out what's important to you. Make the choices and the trade-offs to get it. You can have anything you want in life. I firmly believe that. If you're willing to make the choices and the trade-offs required. So. Love that story. I just really love that story. So by the time you got to college, you, 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 had, a, you had a philosophy, <laughs> a clear philosophy. And when you got to college, you, you realized that it distinguished you from other students. Right. You, 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 um, in, in what way, how did you, how did you sort of conduct your career in college differently from your peers who were around you? Yes. I, I was just much more focused, <laughs> I guess is the, is the main, is the main thing. So, you know, again, just like everything else going to college, parents said, okay, the choice of money for college or money for wedding. So of course we picked help for college. Didn't cover everything, but that's made a whole lot more sense to me. Um, so that meant I'm working because I got to fill in the gap um, on the college thing, but I'm also working because I need to save money for a wedding one day because I'm going to have to do that. So I worked a lot and I got a job at IBM. So I'm literally on campus and then going to work, coming back, 
So I did all that, still trying to be engaged as much as I, as I could. But all of that intention, focus, having the professional experience fairly early, mm -hmm. what I didn't realize is I was actually creating a, a reputation that I didn't even know about <laughs> until I literally <laughs> became like a senior. Um, because people, I had someone finally tell me in a, in a class, like, oh, I'm so excited to work with you. You have such a great reputation. And I'm like, I do? How do I have a reputation? Well, it was just seeing me dressed to go to work, right? Mm -hmm. Come into class, very focused, gaming sun. I'm like, ah, okay. But you don't, I didn't realize how much impact what you do, how you carry yourself, right? What you say, how organized. I was very organized and I was very determined. But all that builds up to an ultimate reputation that you have for yourself. So realize everything you do builds your reputation, good and bad. There you go. So, it, you know, Shelly, a lot of our students have jobs. They have part-time jobs. They go to internships. And, and many of them do serve those internships at companies like IBM or Microsoft or J.P. Morgan. And you really used your time when you had your job at IBM to really understand something about your environment and what it meant to move up in it. What, how did you benefit from that experience during college with your, your job? Yes, I will tell you. Um, one of the things that I, I learned is that people like to talk about themselves. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so being in a business environment, it's a wonderful opportunity to actually find out what do people actually do? You know, what are these different roles? What are these different groups and organizations? Mm -hmm. So my big advice is if you are in the workplace, don't just go in, do your job, talk to your manager, talk to your team, right? And leave. Because if you do, you're only getting like half the benefit. Mm -hmm. When you're there, reach out to people and ask them, you know, just, you can honestly, you'd be amazed how well people actually receive this. You walk up and you say, I'm a, I'm a Spelman student. And one day I aspire to, and then fill in whatever the blank is. Right. I'd love to understand better what you do because I'm trying to understand the different dynamics around business, right? Let me tell you, it works. <laughs> it's really rare that somebody says, oh, go away, kid, right? They, they don't do that. What they say is, first of all, they're honored that you actually ask them. And they'll either talk to you then or they'll have you schedule time. But reach out to people. And listen, I know it's scary. It's scary, right? I don't know them. What are they going to say? How are they going to feel? I get it. But here's where you get a chance to start building up your courage muscle. Because courage is a muscle. Nobody is born with courage. Mother Nature makes sure of that. <laughs> we're all born to fly away, right, when we're afraid. So, because we can't protect ourselves as human beings. So, courage is all about a muscle. It's just exercising it. So, the first step is doing something you feel uncomfortable about. You look at somebody and say, oh, I don't want to ask them. Give this little talk to yourself and say, listen, this could be really important and absolutely help me with my career. So deep breath, walk in and ask. Because honestly, the more you do it, the easier it'll become. And you really will gain a lot of insight. And oh, by the way, you may even gain some mentors as a result of doing this. That's great advice. And, and I hope that all of our students who are on, who are going out to these great internships, uh, take up that advice. I think that's wonderful. Now, um, you met your life partner very early on. I'm going to switch gears here a little bit. Um, and you seem to know very clearly, uh, before even you got engaged with him, what you wanted from a life partner. How did you think about that? Yes, well, um, that comes back to the overall planning and intentional part, because I decided early when I was 16, that I actually wanted to run a company. <laughs> and, and, and I'll be candid, everyone. It's not that I knew what that actually meant. Mm -hmm. It's just that my guidance counselor, when you have that obligatory conversation junior year, mm -hmm. she asked me what I wanted to do. And I said, honestly, I don't know what I want to do after college. And she said, what do you like to do? And I said, I love clubs, right? All the organizations. I was French Club, American Field Service, National Honor Society. I was even a Girl Scout, but don't tell anybody. <laughs> um, and I said, I love running my clubs. And she goes, listen, business is just like clubs, pull people together to a common objective and get things done. I said, great, I'm gonna go run a business. 
And when I looked around, the people that did that were CEOs. So I said, okay, I'm going to be a CEO. <laughs> Honestly, it was that naive and that audacious. <laughs> I just picked it. But now that I picked it, and indeed, you know, Chandra talked about this. Chandler talked about this a little bit in the beginning. I asked myself, okay, what has to be true? Mm-hmm. And then how do I make it true? Mm-hmm. So if I want to be CEO, I was looking at, okay, who are the CEOs? And a couple things were very clear back then. Most CEOs didn't have working spouses. Most CEOs were, not most, just all that I could find were men. Um, I didn't see anybody of color because again, there was no internet. So I can look at our magazines, right? Newspapers and things. And I said, all right, well then I'm going to have to find a husband who is actually willing to support my vision to help me become a CEO and therefore is willing to put my career first. So, okay, then, you know, it it was literally thinking through what has to be true. So that has to be true. So when I was dating and whatever, I actually had set a whole set of questions that I'm like, I'm not, I had to have a list. I'm not going to marry somebody unless they have all these things on this list. I tried to make it as small as possible, but to me, they were all critical to enable me to achieve my, my life vision. I think that's a wonderful story. I have to tell you that personally, one of my daughters-in-law actually did the same thing. She interviewed me uh, before she <laughs> finally decided to marry my son. I'm glad I passed. Uh, <laughs> uh, but but I think uh, the, the, there's a very, very important lesson in this. And, and that is to have, uh, before you, you know, go into marriage or a long-term relationship, clarity about what a relationship is about, um, you know, not only the CE being your aspirations as a CEO, but but what you're looking for in general, yeah. um, I think, which which perhaps uh, we don't really tend to. We think, oh, people fall in love and they get married. <laughs> right. You know, I, that is so true because here's, you know, here's the thing. So many marriages break up because people get to a fork in the road where their vision for the future is different. Mm -hmm. And so if they've never talked about it, and that can be everything from what role people are gonna play. Oh, you mean you're not planning to stay home with the kids? Or, oh, you're not gonna be the one responsible for this? Or, oh, I mean, all these, these, all these, oh, things. Oh, you mean you expect that you're, I'm gonna move with you all over the place? I mean, whatever it happens to be. It's so important to talk about these things so that you can, again, it's all about improving your odds, right. improving your odds for success. Like one of the items on my list, Mary, my husband had to be able to cook. <laughs> now, why did I pick that? Because I'm a good cook. I picked that because I didn't want to be the only cook, right? right? And right. so it's, it's things, it's just, you know, I wanted somebody who cleaned up after themselves, right? <laughs> who actually was a clean person. You know, I mean, there were very simple things that I'm like, okay, I've kind of got this list. So I think it's important to actually have those conversations because then when you come to the hard decisions, you have already created the joint framework right. for how you make those decisions. So it makes it so much easier. I think one of the things that perhaps surprises, may surprise people when they read your book is that, you know, we always hear the phrase work-life balance. And, and, and we think that part of that discussion and that, you know, uh, by figuring out who's going to do what in a relationship is about work-life balance. But you're very clear in your book to counsel against believing that we can get to this point of work-life balance. Talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah, I'm glad you asked me because I have to tell you, I hate the (laughs) term work-life balance. All right, now let me explain why I hate it. What is a balance? Okay, ladies, a balance is a fixed structure, right? Kind of got a pole, bar, two weights on each side. And the weights are even at all times in order to be in balance, right? Well, it's fixed. My life's not fixed. My life looks like this, right? And I'm going to be judged on whether or not I'm holding two things in balance at all times. That's ridiculous. I feel like the term was created to make us all feel perpetually guilty. So there's enough reasons to feel guilty, and I'm definitely not going to accept that one. So no, no. What I believe in is work-life integration, which is I have my professional 
priorities. I have my personal priorities. I put them together and I prioritize ruthlessly, <laughs> which means I get done what I need to get done. And those things that I don't actually need to get done by me, I don't. I either find somebody else to do it or they just flat out don't get done. But this whole notion of, all right, I did two things over here so I could do two things over here so I can do one thing. I mean, I, that, no, I'm one person. Um, and time is the most precious commodity that I have and that most of you will find it becomes the most precious commodity you have. So I try to integrate and do multiple things at once. You know, at work, I do walk and talk meetings, which is great. If we're going to have a conversation, why do we both need to be sitting down? I like to exercise. So let's go out and we'll walk and have our conversation. So I do walks and talks, right? If I'm going out and um, for an event, my husband, and I used to love going to the performing arts when we could. Um, and we'd invite a bunch of friends to go with us because we're going anyway. So let's also have a chance to see friends, have dinner, do right. So it's integrating things together. That's what I think is important because I wear all my hats at the same time. I don't change who I am. That's it's such great advice. So Shelly, tell us a little bit about your trajectory from uh, in your desire to become CEO. We know you didn't you you didn't be, choose it choose IBM, but you did become CEO. So so what were the steps uh, along the way that got you to where you wanted to be? Certainly. So I, I graduated from Wharton and joined IBM. I wanted to be in tech because tech was a growing industry. And I'd heard that if you pick an industry that's growing, odds are they never have enough resources. So therefore, if you're good, and that's the key, if you're good at what you do, you'll get more responsibility faster. Check, right? I'm ambitious. That sounds good. So I picked IBM because it was leading in tech at the time. So I figured, great, I'll go be CEO of IBM. <laughs> <laughs> and I did my research, Mary. So it turned out every single CEO started out in sales. So I started out in sales even though people thought I was crazy. You don't come out of Wharton and go to sales. You become an investment banker or a P&G product manager or an international finance person, right? Or something. I mean, sale, you sell computers, but that looked like the path to power. And I believe in finding the current. So I did sales. And then literally I spent 14 years moving up the ladder at IBM and I actually did well. You know, my last job was actually over in Asia Pacific. I was running a multi-billion dollar division for IBM based out of Japan. And my boss reported to Lou Gerstner, the CEO. Wow. There wasn't anybody in the company that looked like me, higher than me. I had been the youngest black named as an executive. I was the first female African-American set overseas. I mean, so I was, I was on that quote, fast track. But it wasn't clear to me, they spawned a number of things that went on, mm -hmm. that I was actually going to get a shot mm -hmm. to truly compete for the CEO job. And as comfortable as much as I liked IBM, which I did. I mean, I was pretty much raised there. Mm -hmm. I, uh, the CEO goal was more important. Mm -hmm. So I ended up leaving IBM. And ultimately, after a stint with Blockbuster.com as president um, in the late 90s, I worked my way to Silicon Valley, where I was the chief marketing officer and EVP of sales for two public companies, and then got my opportunity to become CEO of a company named Zaplet, which became Metricstream. Mm -hmm. um, and over the course of almost 15 years, built it into a global market leader in governance, risk, and compliance software. So tell us a little bit about what Metricstream does. It, it, it creates a compliance software, right? Yeah. So basically what it does is companies have to comply with a lot of rules and regulations, right, requirements. And we provide software that helps them ensure that they're actually in compliance and prove it when regulators, inspectors, whoever it is, shows up. Mm -hmm. But we also help them manage risk. Ah. The companies have risk registers, risk profiles. They look at their risk across all, all sides, their financial risks, their operational risks, right? Um, supplier risks, um, headcount risks, all kinds of risk. We create software that allows them to put all that together and manage the whole risk management process. Mm -hmm. So that's what we, that was the software that we create and that they still do. Metricstream's still out there and doing well. Oh, that's great. That's great to hear. I'm, I'm gonna remind everyone now that uh, they should be starting to populate the chat with their questions because uh, we're gonna come to you in about 10 or 15 minutes and begin taking questions from the audience as well. So don't forget to ask your questions. Um, so along the way, what I love uh, also about the book is that that you you 
uh, offer some real tidbits and advice, which I think are useful for our students now as, a, as well as when they go out into the world. So one of the things that you say is you have to own your career. What do you mean by you have to own your career? Yes, you know, this is really, really important. You know, many times when we get started, we get the first job, we show up at work, we're working hard, and we're waiting for somebody to pick us <laughs> for the next opportunity, for the promotion, for a special project, for whatever it is. Well, I'm here to tell you, if you wait for others to decide what you should go do, you're not really owning your career, mm -hmm. all right? It's so important to be intentional. If you really, if there are things that you want to accomplish with your overall career, because at the end of the day, nobody can optimize for you better than you can. So own your career. You know, the, the analogy I like to use, Mary, is you would never spend a couple of thousand dollars for an airline ticket. <laughs> Pack your bags, clear your calendar, hold your mail, put your puppy in the kennel, you know, do all that stuff. And then get to the airport, get on the plane, buckle in and look at the pilot. So where are we going anyway? <laughs> right, ludicrous. Everyone's like, of course not. But you know what? We do it all the time with our career. We mm -hmm. spend thousands, if not tens, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars on our education, mm -hmm. on conferences, on exec ed, on the whole bit. And then we go to work and let our boss tell us what's next. Mm -hmm. Let our mentor tell us what we should do. Let's, all right. I mean, it's important to get input. Absolutely. Mm -hmm but you need to take ownership for your career mm -hmm. so that you don't wake up and you're 40 years old and you look around like, gosh, I'm, I'm just not where I thought I would be. Right. I call that the sleeping beauty phenomenon. <laughs> we think that some Prince Charming is going to come and, and kiss us and wake us up or, you know, it's, yes. it's but, but, but knowing that part of that is also that process of knowing what it is, being intentional, being deliberate, it all, it all fits. So you also say that in the course of that, you have to say what you want. Yes, yes, for sure. I'm a big believer. If you don't tell the universe what you want, the universe can't help you. And my experiences have been, the universe helps you. So when you say what you want, if you aspire to something, you know, there's a role you want to play, there's a job you want, there's a project you want to be a part of, there's whatever it happens to be, you need to let people know that that's the case so they can help you do it. People cannot read your mind. I can't <laughs> tell you the number of times people have come to me for advice or et cetera. And I'll say, well, what are you trying to do? Oh, I want to do X, Y, Z. I say, great. Well, who else knows that? And they kind of look and say, well, what do you mean? I'm like, well, who else knows that's what you're trying to achieve? And the answer is nobody, or maybe their spouse or boyfriend or like, no, no, no. You got to tell people. Um, now, it doesn't mean you walk around saying, okay, okay, I want to be CEO one day, everybody get in line, right? And no, that's not what I'm talking about. But you can let people know, you just say it. One day I aspire to run a division, right? One day I aspire to be head of the medical practice, right? One day, whatever it happens to be, just share what, you, what your aspirations are, what you aspire to do. And then here's the key, and it's so powerful, ask for people's advice. One day, one day, one day I hope to be president of a university. What skills or experience mm -hmm. do you think I should build as I drive towards that ambition, right? You ask people for advice. Let me tell you, asking for help, asking for advice mm -hmm. is not a weakness. No. It's actually an incredible strength that people rarely, rarely use. Right. No, that's, that's very true. We have a question here from the audience. Great. How, how have you been able to overcome the imposter syndrome? Ah, it's a wonderful question because the answer is I haven't. I have not overcome it. I've learned how to deal with it. So let me share with you how I deal with it. Um, and when I say that, people are probably thinking, oh, she's not telling the truth. Oh, no, I'm totally telling the truth. I had the imposter syndrome most recently when I got named to the Verizon board of directors. So here I am being named to Verizon, Bo Verizon board. I'm all excited. Go to my first meeting. Now I've been a CEO at that point for a decade. I'd served on public boards for eight years. I mean, this was like, like a lot of brand new thing for me, right? But just I'm getting ready to walk in. I'd look at the rounds. I'm like, 
what makes you think, the little voice, right? What makes you think you can stand toe to toe with the CEO of Walgreens? <laughs> Why do you think the secretary of transportation is going to listen to you? Why do you think, right? Oh, and I'm like, are you kidding me? Right? Are you kidding me? Imposter syndrome sneaking back up still. So here's how I deal with that little voice. Mm -hmm. Number one, and I actually did the research on this. Most people, most people suffer from imposter syndrome. Women more so than men and women of color the most. Mm. Now, what does that tell you? That tells you it's in the environment. Right. It's not real. It's not you. It is environmental. And I think it's because we live in such a judgmental world. So realize this little voice, well, it's kind of like TV. Mm -hmm. It sounds real. It looks real. It can even feel real at times. It's not real. This little voice, it is not real. So mm -hmm. just slap it away. Now, if you can't slap it away, then typically you feel it because you've gotten a new opportunity. Somebody has asked you, to join a meeting, to take a new job, to whatever. And you're thinking, oh my God, I don't know if I can. Did I write that little voice is coming, coming? Well, listen, if they asked you, if they invited you, if they offered something to you, then they believe that you can do it. Right. So if you can't believe in yourself, believe them. <laughs> okay. That doesn't work. Fake it. <laughs> Fake it. Act like you know what you are doing because eventually you will. You mm -hmm. always do. So those are my three steps. And by the way, if, you, if all those things are still not working for you, then that's when you call up your cheerleader. <laughs> and I mean cheerleader, rah, rah, go, Mary, go, Chandler, go, Susan, right? It's, it's, it is the person in your life or people who remind you how good and capable you are. I think have we frozen here? I think we may have frozen. Yeah, I think she's frozen. Let me text her. Okay. So I'm going to ask her. And from the chat. So as soon as we unfreeze our guest, we'll be back. Uh, in conversation with Ms. Archambault, but we're having a little bit of technical difficulty. So she has disappeared from the screen. And we'll wait. There she goes. <laughs> Shelly, one of the advice that you uh, gave in your book is that we have to make a distinction uh, between making choices and trade-offs versus thinking of them as sacrifices. And I just thought that was so well observed. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, I will. Um, so let me first explain what a sacrifice means to me. A sacrifice is when you do something for someone else, primarily, right? If not completely, you do something for someone else. Well, the challenge with making sacrifices is if you do something just for someone else, then you set yourself up a bit because if they're not appreciative enough, if they are not grateful enough, if they don't give you enough positive feedback because of all that you have done for them. You connected on her phone. Oops, can you still hear me? Uh, Fury, I think we're doing okay, thank you. I think we're good. Okay, can you hear me all right? Yes, we can hear you fine, thank you. No, shucks. We got you straight. This is before the internet keeps going out. I think she just froze again. Um, yes, so she's, she, I know she was trying on her phone. Oh, okay. Okay, I'm trying to sell you.
All right, you're going back live in a moment, ladies. Hopefully that will hold. You're live. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much for... uh, that we corrected the technical difficulty and we have Shelley Archambault back with us. So you were ch- talking to us about making choices and trade-offs versus sacrifices. Right, so let me go back to define, and thank you very much for your patience, everyone. There's a storm. Um, so sacrifice, it's something that you do completely for someone else. So what happens is if they are not grateful enough, if they are not appreciative enough, if they you know, don't make you feel that they really, really value all that you've done, you suddenly start to actually get upset with this person mm-hmm. because you feel that, gosh, oh my, I'm not. They, you know, all that I've done for them, right? For you versus, uh, are we still gone? You're back Are on you still not able to hear me? Anyway. Okay, we can hear you. Oh, I'm, you can hear me. I'm so disappointed, people, everyone. Thank you so much for your patience. Um, but bottom bottom line on this, by making choices instead of sacrifices, you get to retain your power because you are making them. And by making them, you're doing them actually for you versus for someone else. So anything that you do now, that doesn't mean it's not helping someone else, right? And it's not support, absolutely. But you are the one that is making the decision and you own it. So keep your power, make decisions, make choices, but make ones that you are willing to live with, right? And stand by so that you can keep that power in your life. Thank you. Shelly, we have a, a couple of questions that ask about, uh, one asked about a humanities major who may want to go into tech and a related question about that says, um, what if you get into a job situation and you don't have exactly the right qualifications? So um, those two answers, what do our, huma- if our humanities students want to go into the tech world as you did, or, and they get there and they don't have exactly the right qualifications, what kind of advice do you give them so that they can move up in the company? Certainly, so first of all, um, humanity majors you know, in tech, they have all kinds of roles that are out there. So totally go into tech if you're a humanities. I wasn't a computer science, I told you, I was a business major. Um, so when you get there, if you find skills that you need and you don't have, go get them. You know, let me give you a real life example. Here I am at IBM. I want to be the CEO. So I watch all the executives. And you know what? They're all really good speakers. Mm. I wasn't at the time. Oh my gosh. If I had to give a speech to a group, I was so nervous. I mean, I would shake, right? At times. And I'm thinking, I have to figure out how to fix this. Otherwise, forget CEO. I'm not even going to make it to executive. So literally, I joined Toastmasters. <laughs> and twice a week, I went, I practiced, I I spoke, I got feedback, right? So there isn't a skill out there and there's all different ways. There's self-taught things, there's courses, there's books. So do not let the fact that you don't have a skill hold you back because you're smart. You can learn anything you set your mind to. This stuff is not hard. So um, go get the skill that you need. So that's my that's my advice. Don't let it hold you back. and. Two, the second part of the question, Mary, was what well, I forgot. You said the humanities major humanities majors and, and how they get those skills. And I think you've answered both, I did answer. the, okay. both of those both of those questions. Um I, we have a, a, a question that has come up. Um, you know, you come you come to work every day and you you know you bring that confidence in. And yet you experience microaggressions from peers, especially leadership in predominantly white corporate environments. And so the question has to do with how do you manage those microaggressions? The same way you had to manage the racial hurdles when you were a child. Yes, I was going to say say, and and trust me, I've had plenty of microaggressions all the way through as well. So there's two ways that I address it. So one, remember the point I made about you can't control what people say and do, but you can control how you respond. 
So I reframe all of those in my head, you know, somewhat, for instance, and it still happens. Oh, you serve on the board of Nordstrom. Oh, it's wonderful that they're improving their diversity, right? (laughs) Okay. So there's two ways to take that. One, I can take it as, okay, they think I got on the board because I'm a black female, right? And nothing else. So I can take it that way. Or I can take it as, wow, you are so insecure that the only way that you're going to feel good about yourself is you have to figure out a way to put me down. I really feel sorry for you. And that's what I do. I reframe it because frankly, there isn't a person out there who has gotten something without somebody opening the door. They open doors for different reasons. You might get the door open because your father played golf with the president of that company, right? You might get the door open because your mother went to that same university. You might get the door open because, right? I mean, there's all kinds of reasons we get the door open. The key, and it doesn't matter why the door was open. It only matters what you do when you step on the other side of that threshold. So when people say these things, just reframe it. They're only saying it because they don't feel very good about themselves. So realize that, right? You can't control what they say, but you can control how you respond. So number one, reframe it so you don't let these things just beat you up, okay? So that's one. Two, I found that in group settings, it doesn't work very well, but one-on-one, you can address it when people do microaggressions. Because I'm telling you, sometimes they don't realize, sometimes they do, but sometimes they don't. Mm -hmm. Um, And you can just raise it. You know, I don't know if you realize, but blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. Let me give you an example of somebody actually doing it to me because we all have things that we say that we don't realize. I was giving a speech and I used the, um, open the kimono. Well, afterwards, a woman came up to me and she said, Shelly, I don't know if you realize but you know, for Japanese Americans especially, she goes, that is really disrespectful. Mm-hmm. And I went, whoa, mm-hmm. I hadn't thought about it before. It mm-hmm. was just kind of in my vernacular because I'd heard it and right expression. Mm-hmm. I've never said it, so it's thrilled that she told me. So, you know, you can raise these things. And if you feel that it's, deeper than that, then get allies, get someone else doing it. Mm-hmm. Yes. No, I, I, you know, you mentioned, you know, somebody has to open a door for you. And, and that reminds me of another piece of advice that you give. And that is spend time strengthening your networks and, and, and understanding, I think, what makes up a network in the first place and how do I strengthen it I think is is um, advice our students would want to know as well. Yeah, so let me, but what I've learned is helping others because a network is really a series of relationships. And what better way to start a relationship than by offering to help someone, mm-hmm. offering or supporting somebody that then creates a positive feeling about you to them it establishes almost the first leg right they'll either help you back or at least right um if it's not return the favor but again think highly of you and give you a chance to actually interact I'm a giver helper anyway. And so this ended up working very well for me. But I would tell you, offering to. I think we're having a little difficulty. Help people is a great way of doing it. Beautiful part about Spelman is I know there are so many opportunities to be involved at the university, but getting involved and engaged with others mm-hmm. working towards something in
All weekend. I've never had the problem. It's a storm. Yes. Oh, I think we heard a little bit of, of, um, of um, that No, no problem. Um, we do have uh, a couple of other questions. In... You don't see me? Or... I see you, but we can't hear you. You can't hear me? Now we can hear you. Okay. Oh boy. All right. <laughs> well, listen, I appreciate everybody's patience. I'm in Tampa, Florida, and apparently we're having a major storm that is causing all kinds of issues. So I apologize, everyone. So I have a great question from somebody in our uh, in the audience who says, what are some of the professional challenges that you've been able to navigate? And what are key takeaways and tools as you look back? Mm. So professional challenges. Uh, one, um, um, a boss who wouldn't promote me. Um, and what I learned there is I finally asked for a skip level interview because I couldn't understand. I was getting great reviews, mm -hmm. um, telling me I'm doing all the right things, but there just wasn't the right opportunity. There just wasn't, you know, opportunity for me. Well, I asked for a skip level interview and I met with his boss and I told his boss that I was interested in being promoted. And he said, oh, I, I know that, but there's just no opportunities here. And I said, here, I said, I'm willing to move. And he said, oh, I didn't know that. I'm, now, again, back to a conversation we were having before, Mary, but they didn't ask me, <laughs> right, if I was willing. They just assumed because my husband at the time was also working, I'm working, that I couldn't move. And therefore, they weren't giving me opportunities. So it's important if you feel you get stuck. What mm -hmm. I learned from that is you have to make sure that, you, that multiple people know not just your immediate supervisor, what it is that you want to do. And they also need to know what you are willing to do so that they don't make assumptions about you that may not be true and, and hold you back. So that's one. Um, another is, oh my goodness, um, a, a boss who, frankly, we went, went through a tough period where he wasn't showing a lot of leadership. Mm -hmm. uh, we had done, we had spent months putting together a new budget. He had told us that we were going to get some investment. His boss had promised him. And so we worked on all this stuff. Bottom line is he came back into the room after the budget meeting and said, we didn't get it. My boss let me down. You know, she didn't blah, 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 blah. And it was all this negativity. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden everybody's like, oh, all these months of work and it's all wasted and everybody's all down, down. And I'm like, wait a minute now. <laughs> you know, this, uh, we can't, we can't leave this meeting being down because all of our teams are going to be down if they think we're down. So I literally was like, listen, we still have the money we had. We just didn't get an increase. Let's figure out a plan. Let's get bottom line. What I learned from that is it doesn't matter what your role is. Right. Leadership. Right. Leadership is how you act. Mm -hmm. It's not your role. So you can always be a leader, even when people who quote should be leaders around you are not. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. So we have another question from our Spelman alumna and former IBMer who is now a tech entrepreneur. All right. She wants to see more people like her, entrepreneurs in tech, as makers and founders in the apprenticeship and incubation uh, programs. So what can you suggest to create entrepreneurs? And I thought it was quite wonderful that in fact, your daughter is an entrepreneur. She founded an organization. <laughs> indeed, indeed. So, you know, my, my big advice is number one, I'm thrilled that you're doing it. You know, if you have a passion and there's a business you wanna build, you know, go for it. But then here's also reach out to others that have done it, right? Reach out to others that have done it to get introductions to people that supported them. Um, back to getting people to open doors for you, right? All, all those things. What do we need to do to see more people in the incubators and the whole bit? Frankly, we need to flood them. <laughs> and when I say flood them, meaning if we can fill that pipeline, right? With even more people that are saying, hey, I'm ready to do this, ready to do this, ready to do this. By sheer numbers, we will also become right, more likely to indeed get selected. And by talking to people who have done it before and been successful, we'll learn. Right. So the key is all of this is learning. So the more you can learn by talking to people who are doing what you plan to do or what you're trying to do, whether it's an entrepreneur or a professional, mm -hmm. and you can start out on first base instead of home plate, right? 
Um, so seek out people who've done what you're trying to do and learn from them. Yes. And in your book, you talk about life lear- lifelong learning, that you, you never stop. Mm-mm. No, it's so true. If you stop learning, then you stop growing. And if you stop growing, there's no way in the world you're going to be able to continue to make greater and greater impacts. So it is, you are always, always learning because the world doesn't stand still and you've got to stay relevant. Right. And I think for those entrepreneurs also, if you're in a big corporation, there are lots of things to learn there that you can then take outside if you're going to start up your own business. A lot of practices and protocols and management um, tips to learn. So, so, so it can be kind of a learning environment for, to prepare you for your entrepreneurship. Absolutely correct. Absolutely correct. Well, Shelly, this has been just wonderful. Are are there any last words of advice that you'd like to give to our students and to the many professionals and alumni? I understand there are lots of alumni who are on this call as well uh, that you'd like to share. We're also going to tell everybody they have to read the book. uh, (laughs) Any advice to get us started? Yes. My my big advice is you get started in your careers. Make sure people know what you do. And what I'm, and you might say, what are you talking about? Well, don't just leave it as a title. When people say, what do you do? Don't say, oh, I'm manager of operations for XYZ company. Because you know what? That doesn't tell them anything. You know, as much as we fight for titles, they're pretty meaningless because every company has a different definition of the role than any other company. Even within the same company, different divisions can have different definitions of the role. So take the time, 20 seconds, to say, oh, I'm the manager of operations. I'm responsible for our customer implementations in our Western region, right? Why do you say that? Because now people know what your skills are. Oh, customer facing, right? You manage a region, right? So that's a set of people. You obviously have some process knowledge, right? Because of your managing implementations, that's process. I mean, you can suddenly, because of what you described, they walk away knowing that you have four or five key skills. Why is that important? Because they may hear of opportunities where your skills are valuable and therefore be able to pull you into those things. So make sure people know what you do so many times that just doesn't happen. And that's really the first step to trying to improve your odds, right? For getting opportunities. And then the last thing I'll leave you with is One, thank you for your patience because of our technical, my technical challenges. Um, But two, if anything that I've said has been helpful or inspirational, I'd really appreciate it if you actually get out on social media, just post something about it. I'm trying to market a a book during COVID. (laughs) Um, And so I appreciate any help that you can provide and just tag me. Well, Shelly, thank you so much. It, it's been a delight. I, I'm sure that everyone in our audience has enjoyed this as much as I have. And as I say to everybody, as you are going off to your Thanksgiving holidays and hopefully um, staying safe, be well and keep the faith. Thank you.